important subject, too, to deal with. But we do need to really champion American agriculture, reach out to the agri ag other agricultural states, and change the whole outlook of the portion of income for American agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Stassen. The final response to Ron Clark's question will be made by Wheelock Whitney. It's great to hear your ideas, Governor. They're, they're very refreshing. I would like to say that as I travel around Minnesota, my heart goes out to the people on the Iron Range where employment is up to 30 uh, plus percent. Uh, the border communities, it's frightful what's happening to some of those communities as people can slide across into the Dakotas and make more net income in their businesses and in their personal lives. I was up in Little Falls the other day, 20 percent unemployment in that single community. And I know right here in the metro area of severe pockets of unemployment that get up into the 30, 40 percent range. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think it, it is difficult to try to come up with a separate solution for each of the areas that we have in Minnesota. We're all in this together. We're a state of four million plus people that, that has problems. What we need to do is work on basically trying to improve Minnesota as a place to expand jobs, a place to work, a place that appreciates private sector opportunities. I've talked for farmers about more processing plants and about the hope of preserving and strengthening the family farm. I agree with uh, Mr. Wongberg about the need to talk about retraining and focusing on new industries in northeastern Minnesota. We may never again see days the way they used to be. But basically, I think we need to talk about restructuring our laws, make it possible for ideas like the Minnesota Enterprise Fund to work so that we could help all of Minnesota and it could be as strong as all of its parts. Thank you, Mr. Whitney. We do have time for another final question, which will, they will be able to give their full two-minute response. Pat Kessler of KSJN will di direct this question first to Harold Stassen. Mr. Stassen, I'd like to go uh, from the long-term economic solutions we were just discussing back again to the short-term solutions, uh, back to the first question. Uh, we talked about the taxes that are going to expire next year. In addition to that, uh, we will have nearly $600 million in fancy book work, some accounting shifts that are coming due. We have hundreds of millions of dollars in loans. Uh, Mr. Stassen, uh, let's talk about those taxes. Would you or would you not keep those taxes to keep the budget balanced, the extra sales tax and the surtax? Mr. Whitney, you said you would cut spending. Tell us where. And Mr. Wongberg, you said uh, we may have to retain the taxes, but we're not going to know until after the election. Can you tell us why? As I've told you, we'd completely overhaul the tax system, and we'd first put the drive on the steps for full employment. And you say we should look at the short term. That's been one of the problems. Politics as usual, short term moves. You need to look at long term things. And this is what we did successfully years ago. And it carried on, the books show it and the records show it, with full employment and tremendous results in Minnesota for about 30 years projecting those policies. In the last 10 years, it's eroded. And there's been this erosion, these mistakes, and this short-term approach, and that is definitely what I would get away from. We would look for long-term solutions from the very day of our inauguration. Thank you, Mr. Stassen. Next to respond to the same question will be Wheelock Whitney. Well, I hope that the <clears throat> next governor and the legislature will have an, an opportunity to look at long-term solutions. But I agree with you that we've got some short-term emergencies that must be addressed. And yes, I did say that I would come down on the side of reduced expenditures. And I'd like to just use an example from my own business life. For 10 years, I headed an investment firm that's now known as Dane Bosworth. And I had some pet projects there that I really believed in. In fact, one of them in particular was opening three offices in suburban shopping centers. I worked very hard, and we got them open. And we had big grand openings, and we made long-term leases. And I was so proud. I, I can never tell you how proud I was. And suddenly our business went against us. The bottom fell out. And they said, Wheelock, what are you going to do? And I said, well, we have to do the have to stop overtime, we have to freeze, put a freeze on hiring, and all those things, and we did, 
and that wasn't enough. So we had to do more. And they said, now what are you going to do? And I thought and I looked and I established priorities and, and I had to come to, to the painful decision to close those three offices. I never would have predicted that I would have had to do such a thing. They were, they were the greatest pride and joy I had. I think as look, and when I'm looking at the state expenditures, nothing will be sacred. We have to look at everything we're doing. We have to make our dollars stretch. We have to establish priorities. I will look at every area of state government and see if there isn't a better way that we could be doing things, see if there aren't some things we're doing that could or should be eliminated, and I'm going to seriously look at every avenue before permitting those taxes to continue. Thank you, Mr. Whitney. The final answer to Pat Kessler's question will be given by Lou Wongberg. Being governor requires that you be responsible. And one ought not to make a decision as governor until you have all of the information that you need to make any particular decision. I'm just suggesting that in terms of the budget that's going to be presented to the legislature in January, that uh, the governor is going to know all of that information until in November, and in particular in December when the most recent revenue forecasts are in place. I think that there is a, such a high probability that it is uh, impossible to get rid of those two taxes in the short term that I would brand anybody who called for their automatic removal as being irresponsible right now. My concern, though, is that we move deliberately and definitively towards a plan that solves Minnesota's fiscal dilemma forever. I'm suggesting that's going to take about a six-year plan, a sequential, careful plan, which will move us away from the shifts we're now plagued by, will move us away from short-term borrowing, will move us to a high credit rating as we've been accustomed to having, which will have us with a prudent operating balance will restore the kind of fiscal integrity Minnesota was known for for so many years. I think that is attainable. I think it is realistic. And that's exactly the direction in which I intend to lead the state. Thank you, Mr. Wongberg. We do have time for one more quick question, which will elic elicit a one-minute answer from the candidates. Betty Wilson will direct her question to Wheelock Whitney. The Minnesota legislature in the next few years may be asked to ratify three proposed U.S. constitutional amendments. Would you quickly say yes or no to each one of the three? First, an amendment to make abortions illegal. No. Yes. I wouldn't take a stand on it. An amendment I to respect the difference <laughs> of view that exists. An amendment to require a balanced federal budget. Yes. Definite yes. Yes. An amendment for an Equal Rights Amendment? Yes. Probably not. Yes. It is now time for the final portion of tonight's pre-primary debate, co-sponsored by Minnesota Landmarks and the League of Women Voters of St. Paul. Each candidate for governor from the Independent Republican Party of Minnesota will make a three-minute closing statement, the order of which was determined earlier by draw. Leading off the closing statements will be Lou Wongberg. Thank you. You're doing well with pronouncing that. <laughs> you know, I'm a uh, Minnesota farm boy. I grew up in northwestern Minnesota. And and I've been very privileged. I'm 41 years old, and uh, every year of my life in the state of Minnesota has been better than the previous year. And I've uh, been fortunate in life to have three children, a son John, a, another son Carl, and a daughter Marin. And uh, when I'm asked about what the issues are in this campaign, and we talk about jobs and we talk about the economy, and those certainly are issues, but I... I think that we've gotten, in recent weeks in both parties, so obsessed with talking about jobs and the economy that we've really forgotten that the real issue may be, will John and Carl and Marin and all the others like them in the state have the experience I've had of each year in the state getting better and better? Will they enjoy a Minnesota where their quality of life increases every year rather than decreases? And I think that the, the verdict is still out. 
I ran into a little elderly lady at a county fair not so many weeks ago, and, and she said, you know, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, as I'm listening to the candidates for governor, it bothers me a little bit because uh, most of them are really focusing on what the problems are. And she said, we know what the problems are, but I'm not hearing very much talk about what the future of the state is, what the vision is, what direction we're going in, what the solutions are that work for us. Well, jobs and the economy are important, but there are deeper issues, such as making our institutions work. The people are fed up with looking at government that seems to lurch from crisis to crisis. They're tired of schools that they, they don't seem to have control of. People are concerned about a decline in the general quality of their institutions and the things that touch their lives. People are deeply concerned about family issues, and those issues drive and move a good deal of people, uh, or many people, uh, as a matter of conscience. And the individual seems fed up with the burden of regulation and the uh, erosions of his own personality. We can solve all the questions of jobs and the economy, and we still will not make Minnesota great. We need to do more than just jobs, more than just the economy. We need to seek every day diligently the kind of excellence that Minnesotans have come to care about in their education. We need to be concerned deeply about crime, and it's doubling, more than doubling in the last decade in the state of Minnesota. That needs to be addressed if Minnesota is going to go forward. The largest minority in the state of Minnesota are handicapped. Fifteen percent of our people have handicaps, and we must do the kind of job of programming for their quality of life. And we must care about roads and bridges and a whole variety of things. This campaign for office will not do the proper job if it bogs down just in talking about jobs and the economy. They are important, but they are not all of the issues. Thank you, Mr. Wongberg. Next to give his closing statement will be Wheelock Whitney. Lou, I know that you and Harold will join me if we break just one rule. We've been so good tonight. And that is, <clears throat> all of us join in applause and appreciation for, to the League of Women Voters for all the work you had to do to put on this evening for all of us. We're very grateful. Thank you. <laughs> and I appreciate the panel. You have raised, surely, some of the really gut issues that are facing Minnesota. We've talked about employment. We've talked about the concern about bankruptcies and businesses on the brink of disaster. We've talked about interest rates and how they're punishing people. And we've talked about the state of, the, of our budget in Minnesota and the serious problem that's facing the next governor and the next legislature. I've tried to, in the time allotted, talk about some of my ideas and hopes. I've talked about the need to focus on decreased state spending I've talked about the Minnesota Enterprise Fund, which I hope will get many new businesses started all over the state without costing the taxpayers of this state one penny. And I've talked about the Minnesota 500 campaign to encourage people to expand job opportunities here instead of taking them to South Dakota and to Tennessee and Texas. And we've talked about processing plants and strengthening the family farm. There's so much that I'd like to do if elected governor. I'm committed to each of these issues, and I would do the very best that I could. But I don't want to lose this opportunity to bring up something that's of a very personal nature to me. I'm concerned that the dislocation of this economy is having a tremendous effect on alcoholism and drug addiction. My wife, Irene, and I have been working in this field for 15 years. Uh, we do so. We've had this problem in our family, and so we know what happens to many people in Minnesota when this happens to them and in their families. I can just assure you of this, that I will carry with me into the governor's office a commitment, an unconditional commitment to the recovery of chemically dependent individuals and their families. I think it's the best investment that we can make because not only does it take people from being tax consumers to tax producers, but it relieves enormous suffering. And finally, I would like to talk about the recovery of Minnesota. I think every individual watching this program tonight and here in this audience can participate in making Minnesota a better state. There is so much that we can do, each in our own way, 
as individuals to improve the life for ourselves and our families, our communities, and our state. I really believe in the state of Minnesota where I've lived all my life. Minnesota's best years are yet to come. Thank you, Mr. Whitney. Concluding the closing statements will be Harold Stassen. As I conclude, I would first of all like to express my commendation to Lieutenant Governor Wongberg and Mr. Wheelock Whitney for their participation this evening and what they've been doing in the campaign, and also, of course, to the League and the questioners. I'd also like to emphasize one additional issue that didn't come up mm -hmm. that I feel is very important. We've had a terrible handling of our tremendous billions of investment in pension funds. I'd lead in a complete overhauling of that. There's been too much in the stock market, too much loss of income that ought to be there, and that's been a bad loss in Minnesota. That's one of the other things that there needs to be leadership on. And I'd like to explain a bit, too, that on the ERA, I believe in it, but I believe as it comes up again, it should add a clause that it could not be interpreted to require drafting of women for combat service, and that it would not mean that you could not differentiate in a logical way, in different ways, between women and men. And if we just ease those problems, then I think the thrust of ERA could be genuinely joined in by all the people in the next years ahead. And on abortion, I feel that I respect the sincere differences of views on this issue. And I do not propose as governor to try to tell those it's something like respecting different religious views. You respect it, and you do not try to impose your views upon them. And that would be my approach on this issue. And then basically, of course, to have our beloved state really get going again. It was a great thrill years ago to see the tremendous moving together of Minnesotans, labor and business and agriculture into better conditions. And it was a memory of what I could do then and my belief that I could do it again that caused me now to submit my name along in this primary. And I appreciate the opportunity this evening to join in this significant program in this campaign. Thank you and good evening to you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Stassen. Uh, I would like to uh, clarify something uh, with the disturbance earlier in the evening. It was not Mr. McDonald who interrupted the debate, and I think we must clarify that. I really thank you all for coming, uh, particularly the candidates, and I would particularly like to thank the panel. I think the questions were very interesting. It has been an interesting evening. Minnesota Landmarks and the League of Women Voters of St. Paul would like you all to be with us tomorrow night at 7 when the candidates for governor from the Democratic Farmer Labor Party will be here in the second of the pre-primary debates. For the League of Women Voters, I'm Sally Patterson. Thank you for joining us and good night. Debates 82 has been a production of KTCA Channel 2. Coming this week on KTCA Channel 2. We're strolling down Fashion Avenue where New York's garment industry shines. But we're not looking for clothes. We're not even looking for the union label. We're looking for answers. Because what we see is a crime. Sweatshops and other blatant violations of both union contracts and the law. You can't talk about it. You gotta live here. This is a jungle.
nonfiction television is investigating a whole lot of trouble on Fashion Avenue. Trouble on Fashion Avenue, Tuesday at 8. For three hours of the best country music in the world, watch Down Home Country Music with host Tammy Wynette, Charlie Pride, and Hoyt Axton, and starring... Country Music, Saturday at 4.55. Meet James Cagney, the song and dance man. Public enemy number one. How you doing, Parker? Stuffy in here. I need some air. Oh, Stuffy, huh? I'll give it a layer. The tragic I mean, hero. Pony rap and you've got no right to keep me here. So get this, from now on, the rules are off. I'm going to talk when I please and do what I like. I'm going to be as mean and dirty and hard to handle as the worst con in the joint. And I'll skull drag any rat or screw that gets in my way, do you hear? Now let me out of here, you hear? And my one head. of America's most beloved performers. They say that's the way Eskimos kiss. Now you can meet this very private man through scenes from his greatest films and the recent and most extensive interview he has ever granted. Meet James Cagney, that Yankee Doodle Dandy. This is your member-supported public television station, KTCA-TV, Channel 2, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Major funding for Evening at Pops was provided by public television stations. Additional funding was provided by Digital Equipment Corporation. John Williams and the Boston Pops Orchestra, and tonight's special guest, celebrated violinist Itzhak Perlman. Now to get things started, here is John Williams to conduct entrance of the guests from Wagner's opera Tannhäuser. <laughs> 